We're going to continue from where we left uh, two weeks ago. We finished chapter 15 of Acts. Today we're going to get into chapter 16, a few verses, 15 verses, and see what the Lord has for us today. Let us pray together. Our God, our Savior, and our King, we are so grateful again for this privilege. We are thankful for what you are doing in our midst. We are thankful for your presence that is always with us, and we thank you that you are with us this morning as we publicly read your word. I pray that your Holy Spirit will be at work in us and also through us as we seek to um, walk in a manner that is worthy of your cross. We thank you and we bless you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You know, one other thing, another testimony that really touched my heart this morning after our first service, um, someone just came and said, hey, I want to give my life to Jesus Christ. I want to be born again. Um, this person has been attending fellowship here for quite some time and said, I, I don't want double life. I want straight. I want to be born again. That is quite a testimony. That is quite the working of the Holy Spirit to, to convince people of their, their lives and to turn to the Lord. Quite remarkable. The, the last chapter we discussed, there was a problem uh, in a church and Paul and Barnabas were sent back to Jerusalem to go and seek counsel plus other Jewish men with them concerning the issue that was a problem, especially to the Jewish converts um, about circumcision. They taught that for you to really uh, be born again, you must fulfill all these things, especially the Mosaic laws. And Paul had warned them about it and spoke about it. And Peter also gave a testimony how God uh, used him to preach to the Gentiles, to bring them to the fold, not to uh, coerce them to uh, be circumcised first, but to receive Jesus Christ, and that is sufficient. And the church... At Jerusalem, the apostles and the elders, and the final word came from James, who is a half-brother of our Lord Jesus Christ. They wrote a letter, and this letter um, encouraged the church. And also after that, we see that Paul carried the letter or the information from the church at Jerusalem, and he went to other churches uh, he had preached at before to go and exhort them and to encourage them. Here in chapter 16, the Bible begins by saying, Then he came to Derby and Lystra, and behold, a certain disciple was there named Timothy, the son of a certain Jewish woman who believed, but his father was a Greek. You're wondering why, why the details of, you know, his conversion and his mother and his father, but these things are going to play a role as we will see he will be given a church to, to oversee or to be a pastor of that church. And by the leading of the Holy Spirit, we'll see how these things are unfolding. And if I were to... Uh, title what we have this morning, I would say, what do we do when God says no? Has he ever told you no? Perhaps every day, but we just turn our blind ear because we want to 
we want a yes, right? We don't like no. We, when, sometimes when he doesn't respond the way we think he should have, we assume that he said, just wait, kidogo, right? Even when he's not said, wait. But we are going to see that here in play. But first of all, this man that is introduced to us, that he, his mother was Jewish and his father was Greek. He was well spoken of by the brethren who were at Lystra and Iconium. So he got born again and he sought really to exhibit godliness in his life as a young person. This is the same Timothy that Paul would re- later write a letter to, the two episodes that we call, you know, the, the, the pastoral episodes. First and second Timothy were addressed specifically to this man. And even at that time when he's given this charge, he's a young man, he's a young minister. Here many scholars would tell us that he was still a teenager, probably from 15 to 19 years thereabout. So he was still very young, but there was great uh, zeal for this young man serving the Lord. He was very excited. He was maybe searching the scriptures, wanting to know what the Lord is speaking. And you know, when you want to influence young men, you have to be, you know, men love things that are very risky. So if you always play safe with boys, in a way you will destroy their lives. We like things that are risky and we get, we get bruises and we, and it's like fun. You know, like, hey, you see this plant? <laughs> boys enjoy that kind of stuff, not girls. So you got to know how to treat boys and how to treat girls. And this man... This young man, Timothy, received the gospel, and when Paul was preaching, in his preaching, he explained the humanity of Jesus Christ, that Jesus Christ left his abode. He came here, lived like men. They took him to the cross. Painful death, he died, and rose up again the third day. And that is the, the savior that we follow. That is our God. And on top of that, when Paul was preaching in the same city where Timothy was, where he got born again, Paul was stoned and left for dead. They dragged him out of the city and the disciples and camped around him, prayed for him, and he came back to life. They tell us that Timothy and his family were part of the believers who came and prayed for Paul, and he regained life. And so you're thinking, this this man is hearing wonderful things happen to Jesus Christ. He's seeing with his eyes the testimony of a man who has been beaten, left for dead, the Lord brought him back to life. It's like, I want to be part of this. I want to follow this God at whatever cost, whether in life and in death, I'm going to follow him. That is pretty encouraging to the younger man. Men love to follow people who are very decisive, people who will risk their lives. And we see that they tell us that he was well spoken of by the brethren who were in Lystra and Iconium. In his young age, there was a great testimony of his life. You know, nowadays people will say, oh, it is very difficult to be a Christian in our days. No, it's not. You make a choice. Either you want to follow Jesus or you don't want to. No in-betweens. 
whether you're 13 or you're 30 or you're 80 years old, you can follow the, the, the Lord Jesus Christ regardless. We understand that there is a lot of pressure. There's a lot of discouragement, a lot of things happening. But at the end of the day, God honors consistency. Be consistent, whether in life or in death, follow Jesus Christ. He had a good testimony. No excuse of age. So Paul wanted to, to have him go on with him and took him and circumcised him because of the Jews who were in that region. For they all knew that his father was a Greek. And now this presents another problem. <laughs> well, previously the problem was the Jewish people wanted people to be circumcised first before you become a Christian. Now we have a Christian and it's not the Jewish men making this decision. That is the apostle Paul himself <laughs> taking him for circumcision. That confusing, right? <laughs> Why do that if you have a letter to take to the other churches and tell them, hey, you ought not to do this. But we got to understand also that there are things that happen for the good of the fathering of the gospel. Later on, this man would be entrusted with a church that would have both audience. And Paul, he's a, very, he, he's a quick thinker, thinking very quick. Perhaps the Holy Spirit is helping him. And he knows that when he put this man in charge, all of these Jewish people will run away. And in his location, he needs to minister to all of them. And he wants nothing that will be kind of like a blame. You know, this Jewish man will start to blame him. Oh, he's not from us. He's not with us. Why? Because they know his father is a Greek. And they don't do circumcision. And for this very specific reason and specific person... Paul de deliberately does that. It is not repeated anywhere again in the scripture, so it is not a norm for us to follow and say, ah, you're born again, you want to serve Jesus Christ? I know what to do. <laughs> Gonna do it. No, 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 no. That is not what the scriptures implies. Paul knew very well that the people know this family and they know his father and he's trying to help Timothy that when he's given a responsibility to lead this church, that this man will not have any excuse. Paul has already interacted with them and he knows the kind of people they are. They can split the church in a split of a second just because of these laws. So Paul did that. And as they went through the cities, they delivered to them decrees to keep, which were determined by the apostles and elders at Jerusalem. So even as they're going through these churches, because you remember before they went to this journey, he told Barnabas that let us go back to the churches we established to go and see how they do. So as they're going back through these churches, this is what they are also delivering and decreeing to these churches what was determined by the apostles and elders at Jerusalem, and that is just in the previous chapter. So the churches were strengthened in the faith and increased in number daily. Church, when you preach 
right. When you probably, probably explain the scripture in a local assembly, people will grow. They'll grow uh, spiritually, people will mature, and also numerically, the church will grow. We see this growth in the book of Acts every time. They preach and the, you know, the Lord asks the church upon thousands and thousands and thousands. Sometimes people are weird. You know, some people would say, oh, I don't want to go to a big church. You know, a big church is not very intimate. <laughs> it's not very intimate. Maybe, you know, the pastor won't know me. They won't know who I am. Who told me we won't know who you are? You come to church, <laughs> and you'll be known. <laughs> well, that should not be a problem. This church, they had thousands upon thousands of people getting born again, getting born again. Do you know why we preach every week? It's because we want more people in heaven than in the clubs. We want people to get born again so that they will see their maker. They will have a relationship with God. They would enjoy their time here on earth because time is very limited. You know, the life you have, it's a limited edition. <laughs> limited edition of Peter. It will go one day. I don't know how long I'm still here. I just realized the other day, I have some white hair in my head. Like three of them. Three. <laughs> Next year, there won't be three. There'll be 15, 20. I'm growing old. <laughs> Gray hair very soon. If the Lord tarries, that is. We're growing old. And so our desire is to see people getting born again, people following Jesus, and people being discipled. And so they went to these churches, strengthening them in faith, and the church increased daily in number. Now when they had gone through Phrygia and the region of Galatia, they were forbidden by the Holy Spirit to preach the word in Asia. Now think about it. <laughs> These men have good intentions to preach the word. They've always been doing that. They were doing that and on their journey, they thought to go a different route and now the Holy Spirit say, hey, wait a moment. Don't go that route. Don't go to this place. In fact, he uses a word that was used there in Genesis, you know, forbidden. The Holy Spirit forbid them to preach the word in Asia. Like Adam and Eve, they were forbidden. They touched a forbidden fruit. They were told not to eat of it, and they did. And we know the consequences and the repercussion of that when you don't listen to the direction of the Holy Spirit. Friends, I believe that, you know, in, in our daily lives, we pray, right? We pray in the morning, we pray in, at night, we pray during the day. We pray for those who pray. But do we receive answers also every day? Do we? I suppose we do. He will say yes to things as well as he will say no to things at the same time. The problem is when he says no, we assume that he did not answer our prayers. Our God knows things He's all-knowing. He knows the end from the beginning. 
You know, sometimes the way he answers people, that is very difficult. You know, you might have people in your family, your friends, whoever. They might be sick. Sometimes the Lord heals them by calling them home. That is hard for us to swallow, right? Sometimes that is how he answers prayers. These people have gone through hard life, a lot of sicknesses, a lot of pain, and the Lord takes away the pain by taking them home. It's painful for us, but sometimes that is how he answers prayers. Sometimes he answers prayers by taking away the things we love the most. The things that brings us comfort, sometimes he will take them away to see if we'll still be in line and online for him. Has the Lord told you now of late? Oh, is he telling you no today? Maybe he's saying, maybe he's saying you give me that phone. He speaks in various ways. And perhaps the people he's telling you not to go and be in fellowship with, they're not evil people. Some of them are believers, but he's just saying for this season and time, don't go that route. Maybe he's saying, I'm not going to give you that house that you want. I'm not going to give you that vehicle that you want. <laughs> or he's saying you are in a relationship that is saying, uh uh, cut links with that relationship. Maybe both of you are born again, but he's still saying, no. You're going to take God's answer or you're going to follow your heart. <laughs> As we normally told, you know, follow your heart. Please. <laughs> My heart is wicked. I don't want to follow my heart one time. If you guys want to follow your heart, good job. <laughs> Have fun with it. I want to follow God. The Bible tells us that the heart of man is deceitful. Beyond measure. Who can know it? Even you. You have hard time understanding. Have you ever had people saying it? I don't know what is happening to me. I can't understand myself. <laughs> when God says no, he means it. Don't go that route. And you know, many times he says that is for your own benefit. For your own benefit, for your own good. He knows that if you go to this specific place, if you do this business, if you relocate to this place, all these things are going to destroy your life. He's trying to protect you but you, in your mind, you're thinking, God wants to hide things from me. <laughs> you think that is what he does? No. That is not what he does. He means well. They were forbidden by the Holy Spirit to preach the word in Asia. And you're wondering, man, it, it is preaching, it is the, the, the word of life, these people are sinners, they need the gospel. There are places for some seasons and times, God will tell you not to go. We will learn later that he will, he will be back in these places. He will go to Ephesus, to Galatia, to all these other places. He will preach the gospel there. But for this specific time, the Holy Spirit forbid them 
not to go there. And apparently, Luke is not giving us a lot of details about it, saying that they were forbidden not to preach the word there. And after they had come to Mysia, they tried to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit did not permit them. But it's, a, it's constant resistance. that so the Holy Spirit is resisting them every time. I don't know how he did it, but Luke's reports to us that the Holy Spirit told them, no, they're going this direction. They're going to do what? Preach the gospel, to preach the gospel. And he says, nope, don't go there. Nope. Nope. Don't do that. Don't do this. Friends, when, when God says no, he has a greater good at the end of the day. What we ought to do is to be rest assured that God is not being malicious. That he does not want you to enjoy a good life. As a matter of fact, this is preaching. Like, God, this is your word we are going to preach. We're just following up to see the fruit. We have already seen one. You know, this young man who got born again and he's really in fire for Jesus Christ, Timothy. Perhaps we, we want to gather more, disciple more people so that they will further the gospel of Jesus Christ. But the Holy Spirit did not permit them again. So passing by Mysia, they came down to Troas. And a vision appeared to Paul in the night. You know, Luke does not tell us that this man, they got very mad and they were so resistant to God and they blamed God for not allowing them to preach the gospel. No, no, no. They said, well, the Lord does not want us to go this direction. We are going to go this direction. So passing through Mercia, they came down to Troas, and a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia stood and pleaded with him, saying, come over to Macedonia and help us. Come over to Macedonia and do what? Help us. So when the, the Lord is not permitting you to go a certain direction, he knows that there is a greater need the other direction. So we see that doors are both closed and open at the same time. He closes this door and opens another door. All for the father ends of the gospel. Now after he had seen the vision, immediately we, did you notice the change of language here? In uh, verses eight, look right and say, they came down, they came down. Now after this vision, we sought to go to Macedonia. That means the writer is including themselves in this journey. Luke is joining them to go to Macedonia. We sought to go to Macedonia, concluding that the Lord had called us to preach the gospel to them. This is the conclusion. The Holy Spirit has resisted us going this direction. Through a vision, a man appears and they are in need of the gospel. And the conclusion is, let's go there. Perhaps that is the direction of the Holy Spirit. Therefore, sailing from Troas, we rain straight calls to Samothrace, and next day came to Neapolis, and from there to Philippi, 
which is the former city of that part of Macedonia, a colony. And we were staying in that city for some days. And you see, the, the beautiful part of this, this is the, actually the, the, the second missionary journey of Paul. And the reason why God forbade them not to go a different direction is because he was leading them. This is the first time they're going to hit Europe for the first time with the gospel. The far end for the gospel. These other people, maybe Paul will come later and see them and encourage them. But there's a greater need for people to hear the good news of God. Maybe you're just stuck here and the Lord is calling you to go to a different place. <laughs> Please go when he sends you. Maybe, maybe, maybe not the voice of God. Maybe this preacher is just repeating things. I don't know what God is calling you to do. All I'm saying is, if he's redirecting you, then you ought to pay attention. He said, hey, my child, if you do this business, it's going to hurt you. What about you get employed for a few years? Like, no, I cannot be employed. I want to be self-employed, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> the Lord knows better than you. So if he says something, you better listen. Maybe the Lord is calling you to, you know, Kakamega Forest, to go start a church there. Still holding on, like, oh, I don't think so. I don't know if, you know, you're, you're, you're putting a fleece. Lord, if you want me to go to Kakamega, show up in my house. I want to hear your voice audibly. I want this and this and this and this to happen for me to know that I'm supposed to go there. Isn't that what we're looking forward to when God speaks to us? <laughs> Put in a fleece. There are some times that we can do that, but when he says you do something, when he says you go, it is not the time to put a fleece. It is the time to go. And wait, when God says no, he didn't say you sit there and do nothing. When he said no to the apostle and the, the people with him, they were on motion. Like he didn't say, we, he said we, we should not go this way. We're going to move this direction. So, it's not a prerequisite to say, voila, he said no, so I'm going to sit here and wait. Upon who? <laughs> no, that, you'll be waiting upon yourself. And you'll be convincing yourself later that, ah, he said now I go. Do you know where you will go? The exact direction he told you not to. Because <laughs> that is what we do. We think, oh, maybe... Maybe there was traffic, so the Lord has cleared it, so I'm going to use the same road. <laughs> that is not how it works. He will say yes, and he means it. They said and went to the far, far city of Macedonia, and they stayed there for some days. You know, the, 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 the other reason why we have the book of Acts as a historical book, it will shed light on the letters that will be written. That when Paul will be writing letters, you'd remember his journey. The routes he took, the places he spent time, 
And when he was writing this, most of it, it he was just in prison, you know. And on the Sabbath, in the Sabbath day, we went out of the city to the riverside where prayers was customarily made. And we sat down and spoke to the women who we met there. This is not the usual occurrence for, for Paul on a Sabbath. We have read before many times that on a Sabbath, he would go into the synagogues and when they would see him, they would call upon, you know, maybe he dressed like a rabbi and they knew that, you know, he's someone who has some importance, who can speak to people. But think about this. It's on a Sabbath, and they choose to go to a riverside. <laughs> They've gone in there. This is a refreshing place to go and think about the goodness of God. If you guys have visited, you know, these waterfalls, the real ones, not this, the ones that you can just jump down and say that, that was a waterfall. No, those are... <laughs> Those are not waterfalls. You know, there's, there's one down, a ten, that road. What is the name? Koromojo. What does that mean even? Koromojo. <laughs> there's, there's a beautiful waterfall there. We went there one time. And just getting under it, and seeing the water coming, rushing down with the breeze. What a beautiful scene to behold. You know, when you, you hear and you read the scripture and the Bible say, you know, and the spirit of God came like a mighty rushing wind. And it clicks in your mind like, ah, that is what it kind of means. Coming rapidly upon to like... Oof, this is beautiful. This is awesome that the Holy Spirit would rush upon us like that, to fill us, to indwell us. And you, you're there the looking at nature, and you're just thankful for what God created. And they chose to go down the river and maybe watch the birds and see the water flow and... Whatever the reason, they were down at the river. <laughs> and this is customarily, they went there to pray. And they sat down and spoke to the women whom they met there. They spoke God's word to them. This is what he does every time. Goes to a place, share the gospel. Goes to a place, share the gospel. Some of you, you know, you, you relocate. You know, you go from this office to this, this town to this town. You know, work-related responsibilities. And do, do you find time to share the gospel with people there? Do they even know that you're a Christian? Can we see Christ-likeness in your life? Do you have the zeal to present Christ to the world? Now a certain woman named Lydia had us. This is Luke reporting. She was a seller of purple from the city of Theatira, who worshipped God. The Lord opened her heart to hear the things spoken by Paul. So this is kind of, you know, a virtuous woman who goes about her business. She's probably a wealthy woman. 
Because in that season and time, to sell uh, gowns and clothes that were purple were very expensive. They were royal clothes. For whatever reason, they were expensive. And uh, some people say, you know, maybe she, she had a business of dyeing these clothes and selling them to people, having her own shop to do that. But nevertheless... Um, she sold them in that city and she worshipped God. Maybe like the other Gentiles who prayed to God and his prayers were hard, but he had not heard the gospel to this extent. Cornelius, you remember? This woman also, the Bible says that she worshipped God. But the Lord opened her heart to heed the word spoken. Like, yeah, we, maybe she believed in a way on the God of Abraham, Jacob, and Isaac. He, he knows a, a bit of the history of the Jewish people. But at the end of the day, is she really born again? Is she really born again? Not sure. But the Bible says that her heart was open to heed the words spoken by Paul. This should be the response of everyone sitting on a local congregation like ours, heeding God's word, receiving God's word, being fed God's word week after week. And when, she, and when she and her household were baptized, she begged us, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. So she persuaded us. You know, th- th- there's a sweetness of the gospel that when people receive it for the first time, they don't want to let it go. They want to be constantly in fellowship. I remember when I first got born again, my life was around church every time. Every prayer meeting, I was there. The church is there, it's dusty, and there's no one to wash. I would wash it myself. The cables and whatever, I would do these things myself without complaining. Why? Because there was a joy unexplained in my heart. Peace that I couldn't find when I was drinking with my fellas out there. Just peace, joy, fulfillment. And I think it should not die. That the things I did when I got born again, the zeal I had, I want to have it now. I want to continue serving the Lord that way. I want to serve people. And you know, the, 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 uh, our generation today, people don't want people who will serve them. People are looking for people who will be bosses over them. The mighty man, you know. You get into their offices and it's, you know, red carpet. You know, with a wonderful four-foot, photo of myself like this. (laughs) Expensive stuff, expensive watches, gold watches for those apostles, you know them. (laughs) The simplicity of the gospel, they don't want it. They don't want it. And we are not going to succumb to the pressure. Oh, The man of God has to appear this way. No, 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 no. We don't see that in the Bible. We just see people getting born again, and those people, they go to other churches, they preach, people get born again, and the church grows. We ought to grow, all of us, myself, yourself, so that we can touch lives out there, so that lives can be transformed. And this lady said, hey, 
Can you guys remain behind? I know you guys are men. I have food for all of you. <laughs> you know, feeding a bunch of guys is it's quite something, you know. Not just one meal. You know, breakfast, lunch, dinner, and tomorrow, and tomorrow, and tomorrow. Oh, man. It's a blessing that for us as men, we don't got to think about the menu. Otherwise, we'll stick to one thing that worked forever. <laughs> right? This, this menu worked, and it's not complicated. It's not going to make me wash the dishes every time. <laughs> I can use the plastic, whatever, to store food in there. We're good to go. We, we, we don't want to think about food. We want to solve the world's problems. <laughs> While our wives, you know, we were making fun yesterday with some guys here. You know, we think our wives or women who are married, they would gather somewhere and talk about us. They came into my house where things were very visible. We could find things. Okay? Sufriers are here. Plates are here. Things are here. They show up. You have to Google. <laughs> you have to Google things to find them in your own house. If they disappear for a week, thankfully, they will cook the food and pack it. Like this, you can eat this on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. And when I come back, we can cook something fresh. You're left there, you're trying to find one thing. You have to call. So these married men will feel me. We call for things that we bought and we set them somewhere. <laughs> and then you can't find them. That they disappeared. And then you call, they lead you somewhere, you find a hundred of them. Like, man, why do you do that to us, ladies? <laughs> you guys know it's true, right? We are suffering. <laughs> We're going through a hard time as men. You know, we, we need to have our own gathering as men, just a retreat out there. You see if they will call us for something. <laughs> you guys, you think you won't call us? Listen, you know, they'll, they'll call us, but one of the reasons, like, what? I wasn't calling for anything, just checking. If you are alive, <laughs> that is what matters. You are alive, we're good to go. That had nothing to do with our text today. This lady, Lydia, as I bring the worship team to come, she welcomed this man in her house because it was very fresh. Receiving the gospel, how it is explained, oh, it gives us such a joy, such an assurance. You know, what, what assurance do you really have in Christ? As I shared earlier, this person who said, hey, I want to get born again. That was my peak for the day. I don't want a double life. I want to be born again. Maybe we also have someone here who said, I want to, I want to be born again. I want, I want to be a Christian. I've lived a double life. Maybe the Lord today has been telling me, no, don't do that but I just want to do it because I feel it. Maybe he's calling on you. Say, hey, my child, you have strayed for some time. You want to come back. Is the Lord your shepherd? David say, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He leadeth me. 
you know, his rod and stuff, they comfort me. You guys know what that means? The rod, that was a, a shepherd's stick that they used to, you know, when the, the sheep is trying to go astray, they used this rod to bring the sheep back to the fold. And how is it that David says, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Which means David loved the discipline that came from the Lord. That when the Lord is disciplining you, he means well for you. He wants you back into the fold. Maybe it's you today. Sometimes discipline is painful. But the Lord does it for the, the, the people that he loves. He disciplines. He speaks to them. He would tell them yes as well as he will tell them no. What's your part? As we bow our heads and think about our lives for one minute, the Lord is gracious enough to give us opportunities to return to him. He's gracious that he will call on to us. Even in that moment when we think all is gone. He knows how to restore your soul. Restore. I think that should be our prayer today. That God restore my soul. I have become a prodigal. I want to come back. I want to have a relationship with you. I don't want the enemy to take advantage of me. You know, the enemy will whisper things to you, saying, see, the Lord did not help you in this situation. See how your life is miserable. The Lord is interested in reviving you again. He's interested in changing you. But are you willing to return to the Lord? Our God and our Father, we are so thankful so grateful for what you have done. We thank you for your word that is alive and sharper than any double-edged sword, piercing into the bone marrows deep inside our hearts. And those things that we hold in on that are not godly, I pray that you give us the strength to run away from them. By the strength of the Holy Spirit, I pray, O oh God, today that you will restore us. I know you're willing, God, but I pray for my dear brothers and sisters here that if you're speaking to us in that regard, may we yield and heed your word today. For we know that your word brings Life. We ask of you, God. Holy Spirit, we pray that you will fill us. Holy Spirit, we ask that you will give us the strength to say no to ungodly things and to say yes to righteousness. For the grace of God has appeared to us teaching us to say no to ungodliness. That grace is present with us here today. I pray that we will accept it. We thank you, God. 
that as we give to you, as we serve you with our offerings, our finances, we pray that you bless our, the, the works of our hands and may we give a percentage that is glorifying to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.